This is the Defenders Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're exploring Marvel 616, Episode 4, Lost and Found. Welcome back once again, fellow Defenders, to our Marvel podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're continuing our bite-sized coverage of Marvel 616, the anthology documentary available on Disney+. Plus. We're so excited to get back to Marvel in 2021 that we wanted to cover something Marvel before WandaVision begins on the 15th of January. So uh, John decided to uh, to jump into the documentary series uh, Marvel 616. I've really been enjoying it uh, so far. Yeah, it's been really good. And this one, episode four, Lost and Found, is... I think the most different of at least the first four, mm-hmm. um, as we are watching through uh, the eight episode Disney Plus series, yeah. um, this this to me was the most different and. In the end, I really ended off uh, enjoying um, this one uh, yeah. directed by Paul Scher. Yeah, yeah. It's a really interesting one. Um, make sure you subscribe to the podcast over at tvpodcastindustries.com and you'll get access to all of these podcasts and our upcoming coverage of WandaVision and all the other shows that we've covered in TV shows uh, and movies that we've covered over the last uh, couple of years of podcasting. We'd also love to hear your thoughts. If you want to email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, let us know what you've been thinking about Marvel 616, what you're excited for coming up in 2021, and hopefully uh, that you've been enjoying the podcast as well. Uh, We'd love to hear from you and let us know what you think. John, will we jump into our bite-sized coverage of Lost and Found? Definitely, yes. So what's the kind of overview of this one? This is Paul Shear. Um, I know him as a podcaster. Uh, mostly I've seen him in so many movies. He's kind of a, a, an actor that's been in so many things. You'd certainly recognize his face. Uh, I know him as a podcaster on a, on a podcast called uh, How Does This Get Made? Uh, very funny concept for a podcast. It's um, It's looking at movies that didn't do spectacularly well. And the idea is, well, how did it fall apart? How how, how did this idea <laughs> that somebody said, I'm going to give a couple of million quid to to make into a movie, well, yeah. how did it fall apart? How did it convince someone to get that money in the first place? And how did it fall apart and not make the money back effectively? It was a great idea to begin with. I think towards the end of the time I was listening to it, it had turned into a live stage show and had been had had a bit too much promotion in it so it was like every five minutes they seemed to be reading out an advert uh, and I kind of felt it was that they'd lost the the fun of the of the podcast part of it but I did love Paul Shearer on that show he's a very funny comedian uh, very very funny as a presenter uh, and I think um he's taken his his mind for how things work uh, over to Marvel so what's the what's the central thing that he's doing here yeah Dan? I mean look in essence from a from a documentary side of it this looks at the minor or you know back characters in the Marvel ca- catalog but it, at its most weird it is almost a meta documentary that is really a comedic spoof pilot pitch within mm. this documentary looking at um, minor characters and so really here it's it's Paul Shear looking to uh, bring back um, this sort of B-list character uh, into another kind of artistic form, in this case, animation, mm-hmm. um, and going through that process. Yeah, like, um, there's always this joke, you know, that nobody recognizes the characters um, that Marvel put on screen, and then once they put them on screen, it's like, oh wow, everybody knows who these people are. You know, Iron Man would be would have been considered probably a second tier character uh, when they released the first movie of Iron Man. Now the whole universe of Marvel movies is out there featuring loads of characters that people may not have heard of before they came to the screen. So the joke here with Paul Shear is that he wants to find the most obscure character to put that character and give them give them some of the promotion that they may not get otherwise. Exactly. Um, now, I would say, looking at the way that he's formed this story uh, into this documentary, it's not far off the truth. Like, I don't think anybody would go out to say, I'm going to find the most obscure character and see if I can turn them into something that Marvel will do. But for a lot of, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the people behind the TV shows, they will find their favorite character who maybe people haven't heard of, but it will be their favorite character to begin with. Definitely. And then they'll be asked, you know, uh, Disney has done this with, uh, with their TV shows and, uh, Netflix used to do it with their, with their shows where they would ask somebody to come in and give a treatment to a character that has been chosen to, to get the TV treatment, for example. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think definitely this episode is in two parts. The first part, does feel the most documentary like um mm-hmm. where Paul Shear is interviewing um three 
comic book writers. You've got yes. Reginald Hudlin, mm-hmm. who did Black Panther. You have Donny Cates, oh, yes. um, who did Donny. Venom, but also Doctor Strange. Yes, you know, Cates, um, well. yeah. And also Jerry Duggan, who did... Um, the recent Big Defenders book, didn't he? Yeah, and I think famously Deadpool. Mm-hmm. And they kind of talk about different things here. And it's kind of interesting. You know, Reginald Hudlin talks about, you know, taking... Um, uh, underutilized heroes and effectively reinventing them. And the mm-hmm. example he gives is X-Men, uh, where they were effectively going to be canned after a hundred issues. It That's wasn't right. making the inroads and they were, um, taken on in a different way. And, and also the way Reginald Hudlin took on Black Panther. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, he says in the documentary, I wanted to make it provocative and political yeah. that was the essence and that changed up um black panther and i thought that was a really interesting take and then you have donny cates who talks about the reinvention of characters and the, the example he gives is wolverine um yes. I, I suppose you could also have uh within this as well son of satan which is another thing he talks about which is effectively hellstrom and uh-huh. um, got its own tv show this year yeah ex- exactly uh, and reinventing these characters and adding different perspective and put, bringing them something different or mm-hmm. bigger um, and and really changing them up and then you have uh, jerry duggan talking about really sort of mining peripheral characters or b-list characters a bit like what paul Scher is doing here i mean he talks mm-hmm. about you know there's a number of things being talked about here i think um like damage control was the 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 non-superhero uh, team that go up to clean up yeah. after uh, the superheroes have effectively laid waste to some city in Absolutely. some form do you remember when we were on the marvel netflix stuff there was actually talk of a damage control the, series there was, was yeah it was absolutely set in stone this was going to be their comedy tv show that they were going to do from marvel it yeah. was going to be damage control um, and i can't remember why it was cancelled in the end i think uh, there was kind of this thought of should marvel jump into doing a comedy TV show uh, at this stage. Now, I think c- upcoming, I think I've heard that the She-Hulk show is going to be a 30-minute comedy uh, in in a, a, a lawyer's office, effectively, is the, the concept behind that. So they've still been looking for that property that they want as a comedy. Yeah. But interesting that the Damage Control one was in there. Damage Control as, as a concept, I think, was the one that came into Spider-Man um, Homecoming, the first Spider-Man movie. Uh, they're the ones that took over the operation to, uh, to clean up uh, after the, all the damage that had happened in New York um, from yeah. the Vulture's character, yes. effectively. That's what, that's what turned him into the Vulture's. So Damage Control has actually made it to the screen, which I think is really interesting. But I do love that this idea from Jerry Duggan, where he's kind of going, look for those peripheral peripheral characters that some people are aware of and try and see if you can do something <laughs> yeah, well, big and different. I, I think one of the interesting ones for me, he talks about Dr. Druid, um, the bargain basement sorcerer supreme. Mm-hmm. The way Jerry Duggan describes it is you know, this hilarious backstory where effectively he is given magical powers by the ancient one because the ancient one just wants to be left alone by him he's annoying him um but you know recently he's been used in mark wade's uh doctor strange run so that that it you know they they do make it there and and the most bizarre one from the 80s is u.s trucker um a (laughs) cb radio receiver and when he presses his tongue onto his fillings after experimental surgery, after a crash with his brother following, you know, where he's driven off a cliff and immediately gets experimental surgery. And the whole run of issues ends up with him driving a truck in space. And yeah. um, so, yeah, completely uh, way out there. But I think the second part of this episode then focuses very much on Paul Shear choosing um, a group of characters called Brute Force, um, yes. which was a four-issue run in the 1980s. And um, basically, they are described as the animal avengers that protect uh, the the environment. There's a mm. dolphin, a lion, an eagle, a kangaroo, and a bear. And yeah. um, it was... It, and, you know, they kind of asked the question, why? Why was this four issue done? And what can we do to reinvigorate them? Um, and, you know, Paul Shear goes through, um, effectively the special projects as it's from the 1980s. And when you look at what he was involved with at Marvel, it was Star Wars, G.I. Joe and Transformers, mm-hmm. very successful uh, spin outs. Uh, but the interesting thing that he, he kind of talks about and is kind of backed up by the writer who Simon Furman who he interviews as well is that you know it was supposed to be 
eco-themed, you know, very loose setup, but it was the likes of G.I. Joe, the likes of Transformers, it was toys being put into comics. And what they wanted was to create a comic series that would translate into toys. Of so course. these animals become very bionic yep. um, so that they can be turned into toys. They are um, hilarious. And, you know, I must say, I do it's love really that, interesting. Yeah, I do love that piece from the special projects editor on, on Marvel where it's basically saying, I used to have 20 of these come across my desk every year um, and I just choose a writer and an artist to go on the project. I love that he's kind of saying, I don't have any power as to who commissions this stuff. Somebody contacts us and says, you need to do the special project, and my job is to deliver the special project. <laughs> it's, a kind of a, it, it's kind of a thankless job, yeah. uh, but if it hits, it hits really hard, I suppose. It's kind of, the, kind of the thing. So I did like that that's your job is don't question what we're telling you to do. You just don't need to go and find a good writer to write it and a good artist to, to cover, it up, cover it over so we get it out there. That's it. And, I mean, ultimately, Paul Shea then takes these characters. He tests the idea at Comic-Con. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, if you take it out face value, then everyone said this could be really neat. Um, mm. I thought that was really interesting. And, and I'm assuming it wasn't staged in any way for uh, the documentary, but it could have been. I feel like it might have been, yes. But he tests the idea at San Diego Comic Con. He gets the animation studio involved to, to begin to sort of put, uh, you know, meat on the bones of these characters, mm. voice actors. And you have this really funny little segment of the documentary where you're they're running through the different characters. I think Boomer, the kangaroo, is an assassin, but she bounces. So the idea that there'll be too much noise in trying to sneak up <laughs> someone because you have boing, boing, boing. I you know, this. you've got yeah. Dr. Echo, which is the the dolphin mm -hmm. that is has an Uzi. And a um, doctor's. And, and a doctress. <laughs> uh, you've got Lionheart, the lion, saw the eagle who has jets on him, and then the bear. Yeah. Um, and it, I, it, lo I do love, again, you know, this, this whole segment of pulling apart the immediate flaws in every one of these characters. It's yeah. just so much fun. You know, again, the eagle with rockets that make him fly more. <laughs> <laughs> I can already fly, but if I have rockets on me, I can fly even more and yeah. even faster. <laughs> he, he looks at the toy design and, you know, it, you, everyone remembers the um, the gauntlet from Avengers Endgame mm -hmm. um, and that toy that, that came out and they were looking about doing the bear claw yeah. um, and, and that you could, because they're eco, then they could use the claws to furrow little um, channels in soil to plant <laughs> seeds and to go, and you're just kind of going, okay, this is just nuts. And, yeah. but ultimately they create a pilot and, you know, it ends up with Porsche and um, sitting down in front of the Disney um creatives to pitch the idea of mm -hmm. this and you get an, a nice little kind of you know minute long animation of brute force yeah. being reinvented um, and i thought this was actually really quite nice and as i say this was the one that i just had no um idea which way it was going i mean mm -hmm. you immediately think this is just going to be them running through B-list minor characters yeah. like you had in the first part, which was v massively interesting. It was but great fun, yeah. It took it to another level by then trying to bring um, a set of these characters back to the mainstream and going through that process of how <laughs> you do it. Because like you say, you know, Iron Man, in a sense, wasn't something everyone was raging about yeah. until the movie. Yeah, like it, it, he always had a book, at least, yeah. I suppose. So I don't, I don't want to underplay how how popular a character Iron Man was, but it was that Marvel had sold off all their mainstream characters to be made for, by other companies um, for their movies, and suddenly they were kind of left with those lower-tier characters that didn't have the most massive, that didn't have the Spider-Man following. But yeah, uh, but yeah people, people often undersell that. Iron Man definitely still had a following in comic books. But um, but not at the level of Spider-Man. But I love this concept of taking, this is how weird comics were in the 80s. These people got a four-issue set and then having a load of comedians pull them apart uh, because they come up with <laughs> yeah. some really funny ideas. And then seeing if you could actually deliver on uh, on creating a cartoon out of this. That moment where he's talking to the animation studio and writes a number on a piece of paper and goes, how much do I get for this? And you can tell by Paul Shears kind of acting at the moment he's trying to kind of say, I'm hoping for a six-episode series out of this. And they go, you could get maybe one or two minutes of animation for that. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Really good stuff. Yeah. So uh, this, is the, yeah, this is the most surprising one for me. Hmm. Uh, 
so far and i think uh i really really enjoyed it 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 was good fun i think it 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 just changed up how you would do this lost and found um in in a different way it Mm -hmm. did it in a different way that actually made it much more engaging because you then start to think well Okay, is this what they, you know, how they reinvigorate the likes of, you know, some of the bigger characters that we now have, yeah. how they brought them more to the fore and, and just hearing historically about Wolverine, you know, yeah. where they say he looked like a pussycat and they made him more kind of like extreme yeah. with the, with the claws. Yeah, the and, claws and, looked like they were part of the gloves. Yeah, actually, exactly. Kind of yeah. So really kind of a nice look at this sort of uh, murkier or, or lost world of uh, of Marvel characters. Yeah. And as comic fans, both myself and John, uh, particularly our favourite characters from, from comic books, we've been subject to this quite a lot over the years. You know, both uh, Doctor Strange and Nick Fury, our two favourite characters, have come come and gone over the years. Someone has a good idea, brings the comic book to life for six or seven issues, and then they disappear for four or five years, and then they just do guest appearances in other books, that kind of thing. Um, So we've seen this as fans of very particular uh, characters. I know there was a really good reinvention of Nick Fury Jr. recently by the artists ACO and James Robinson. It was, it was kind of a, a concept of having Nick Fury Jr. drawn drawn in the Starenko style uh, from the 70s, which is Nick Fury's most popular period. So a really cool idea of reinventing the character. Sadly, only lasted uh, 10 issues, but loved every minute of that. So I love when my characters, characters that I really like, are kind of reinvented and trying to see if you can get them back into the the uh, mind of new kids reading comic books. So I know Doctor Strange has been reinvented so many times that you're sick of hearing his origin story. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, it is one of those things. The origin story of Doctor Strange is just a classic, and yeah. it is really strong. Yeah. And the problem is, it almost like he he got trapped by that, and so any retelling had to go through that. And I always felt and that just wanted to see him sort of breathe and and, and live beyond that more and yeah. i think actually with the the doctor strange movie and certainly i suppose moving forward it seems like possibly he's taking uh, the tony stark role for the face vault who knows i yeah. don't know it's just conjecture but i know with jason aaron's last days of magic and then damnation with donny kate and now with the sorcerer supreme in space but also then the next iteration surgeon so supreme yeah. um by mark wade yeah. you know it, it's really kind of expanded um the feeling of, of doc strange which i absolutely love it's really kind of expanded the world with zelma mm-hmm. and also the ghost basset hounds absolutely. as well yeah. you know so i love and we have strange um, academy as well strange there. academy so loads going on with Doctor yeah. strange now definitely and i know when a little private secret between you listeners and us when john came out of doctor strange the movie he said i absolutely love this finally it's done now. They've finished the origin story. Now they can move on. <laughs> that was kind of his overall review of Doctor Strange. I love the movie. It was great. But the origin story is done now. We can have another story with Doctor Strange. And we've waited five years. We're going to yeah. get it in 2022, hopefully, but, <laughs> if the world goes well. But, but, if, but this part of the documentary was definitely my favorite part of it. Yeah. I did love the documentary overall. But this part where he's talking to three of three really great writers talking about picking characters and bringing them back over and over again. For me, that was my favorite part because I've seen that so often with my favorite character, Nick Fury. Exactly. So. Yeah. And I, I think just, you know, the, the difference in Lost and Found, it can be the B-list characters, but it can be more mainstream characters yeah. that lose their way in, in terms of the writing. Exactly. But are found again by new writers coming in with different perspectives, yeah. which I think is what episode three uh, and two do, you know, through the artwork and through the writers mm-hmm. that they bring something a fresh perspective a different angle to it um so yeah again another really uh nice little uh episode from marvel 616 series excellent thanks so much once again for joining us for the fourth episode of marvel 616 it's eight in total of marvel 616 i don't know whether you're watching all of them uh, or whether you're just dipping in and out of the ones that you're interested in but uh but so far all four of them we've really enjoyed and thank you so much for joining us yeah we will be back next for marvel 616 Episode 5, Suit Up, which is all about people enjoying cosplaying their favourite characters, which I have to say I'm really looking forward to. I think having gone to New York Comic Con and seeing what the cosplayers can do is just phenomenal. It's It's so good. And just really intricate designs to really, 
you know, people starting out but making something really, really great or, yeah. and some just being so simple that it sort of transcends cleverness. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, what was it, the diamond above the head and it was a sim uh, and that's oh, yeah. Yeah, really that's good. good. Like, cosplay. you just go, ah, I yes. like it. Yeah, um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. If you've been to a big a big comic convention, you'll, you'll definitely recognize how talented uh, some of, of the cosplayers can be. It's amazing. And throughout the series so far, throughout these four episodes, I think we've had a moment where there's been cosplayers shown throughout throughout them. So, uh, so in the writing episode, uh, they were talking about writers going to Comic Cons for the first time and seeing the character they created on a page for three months before, and suddenly people are there at comic conventions dressed up as this new favorite character brought to life. So, I'm really intrigued to see uh, what this one's going to be like. Again, thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us, fellow defenders. Uh, remember, keep watching, keep listening. And keep defending. Bye. Bye.